Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and the middle of the night to our colleagues in New Zealand. As Jennifer said, my name is David Manicum, Special Advisor with UNHCR. So welcome to all of our guests from around the world for this high-level dialogue on how community sponsorship can contribute to more and better protection solutions in time of COVID and after. More safe new homes and warm welcomes for those who have lost their homes, their livelihoods, their countries. We ask every one of you from ministers and commissioners to community organizations to private citizens to reflect during this event on how you can make more safe new homes happen. Both refugees and your communities will richly benefit if you do. One of my jobs is to say thank you to those who have worked very hard to create this special gathering of distinguished and passionate speakers so that those speakers do not need to use their precious time to do so. So thanks to the hardworking staff from all the partners in the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, the Government of Canada, UNHCR, Open Society Foundations, the Joostra Foundation, and the University of Ottawa Refugee Hub. GRSI supports the adoption and expansion of refugee sponsorship programs globally, from New Zealand to Argentina to Portugal to Ireland, to increase resettlement opportunities and protection space, to improve integration by engaging governments, community groups, individual citizens, philanthropists, and businesses to strengthen local host communities, to promote welcoming and inclusive societies. We are delighted to have seen more than a dozen new country programs develop in a few short years. Working with our global network of networks, we do outreach to potential adopters, share policy and program design and implementation expertise, and provide training, resources, and connections, and a lot of moral support. At this time of great need for protection solutions for the world's refugees, those whom we have so badly failed as a global community, I want to leave you with this thought as we begin. We here are all advocates. But our citizens of goodwill, busy with the challenges of daily life, do not always hear our voices. But those who have dedicated their time and energy and emotions to taking responsibility for welcoming refugees to their community become a different kind of advocate. If your next door neighbor is in a group sponsoring a refugee family's journey, and one morning at the bus stop, they tell you about this family, their needs and energies, their traumas and skills, their overwhelming desire to contribute, you listen. And if they tell you that they take the eight-year-old girl in that family to soccer practice twice a week, you hear that. And if they ask you to take her next week because they cannot, and you see an eight-year-old girl from a completely devastated city in Syria running up and down the soccer field in the summer sunshine in Ottawa, or Birmingham or Munich, or a small town in the Basque country, with all the other eight-year-old girls, you never ever forget that. And you will always be an advocate for welcoming the stranger who has lost their home. And others will listen to you and understand. Now to our short, short opening video presentation. Thank you. Community sponsorship is a groundbreaking approach to helping refugees find safety. This approach brings small groups of local citizens together to welcome newcomers into their communities. This is another part of just being part of a global community, being aware of other people and ourselves. And the reciprocal relationship is really exciting. Tens of thousands of people in a growing number of countries have taken part in community sponsorship programs to date. Others are working to launch similar programs. We are seeing amazing results, a positive impact in big cities and small towns. A family will now be identified for us. It's... This is giving grassroots ordinary people the responsibility for the entire journey that a family goes on from when they land at an airport through to them being completely resettled, integrated, happy. People live in the area where the refugees are going to live as well, so they are part of that community. We've discovered there are people in the community who have all sorts of skills to contribute. 
Estamos todos para tratar de integrar a gente que no eligió salir de su país, tuvo que salir de su país. No es solo al refugiado, es a la sociedad que la hace crecer, la hace estar más unida. One of the most important things in settlement is jobs. We actually need immigration from a workforce point of view. So my advice to business is to get involved either through providing mentor groups to help do the settlement or through hiring. Having things brought down to a community level really personalizes the whole issue. It combines the numbers with the integration capacity, so it not only increases the possibility of more resettlement places, but also looks to the quality of those resettlement places. Hoy le toca a este grupo desplazarse. Tal vez el día de mañana me tocará a mí. Y ojalá llegue el día en que nadie tenga que salir forzadamente de su país. Entonces creo que hemos ganado en sensibilidad y en humanidad. The experience that we've had in Canada is that community-sponsored refugees tend to do really well, integrate very quickly into their host community. But the other thing is that the host communities are transformed by these refugees. I know for my children, it's been a real humbling experience for them as well. They will have grown up knowing that their family have been involved with bringing a family over from a country where life was very dangerous. They're very willing to be part of the community, to get involved in things, and it has been great to have them as part of the community. I mean, basically, they're going to be our friends for the rest of our lives. It is personal to help people be at home here in a place that I absolutely love. So that's my absolute dream, really. Like many of you, I have seen that film more than once, um, but I have to say it always brings tears to my eyes and I am, I think, equally moved by both how rapidly sponsorship is spreading all around the world and also the real power, the strength and the compassion that exists in our communities and in all those voices. Um, I'm delighted now to turn the floor over to Marco Mendicino, Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, and of course, our dear partner in the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. Minister, the floor is yours. Well, good morning and good afternoon. Bonjour. And uh, with some sympathy for our colleagues in New Zealand who, uh, who are hanging in there despite being 16 hours ahead of Ottawa time. Jennifer, it's great to see you, and David, uh, thank you so much for those opening remarks, and to the whole team at GRSI, the UNHCR, Supporting Foundations, the University of Toronto Refugee Hub, and all distinguished colleagues on this call. It is a special honour to hear and learn from you today, especially during these unprecedented times, so we can directly share our experiences and our successes in supporting refugees. Last month, the UNHCR published its annual Global Trends report showing that the number of people forced to flee their homes reached 79.5 million people by the end of 2019. This is a stark reminder of the defining role that many of us can play in the lives of vulnerable people needing to secure a new life in a new country. This challenging time calls for a strong cooperative response from nations that have the resources, the infrastructure, and most importantly, the will to welcome refugees compassionately into our communities. On each of these scores, Canada remains strongly committed to the cause of refugee sponsorship. While today's conversation will focus on community sponsorship, I would like to highlight the number of concrete ways in which we are continuing to make progress with regards to refugees on the whole. First, despite a number of COVID-19 travel restrictions in place, we have continued to resettle the most urgent cases in Canada. Second, that for those asylum seekers who are already here in Canada, we continue to accept claims. Third, that we remain committed to including refugees and the protection of vulnerable persons as part of our overall immigration plan. Fourth, that we continue to commit our resources to a number of pilots, including a dedicated stream for human rights advocates, including vulnerable women and girls. 
And fifth, and perhaps most importantly for today's discussion, we have quadrupled the number of community sponsorships over the course of the last four years. Je suis confiant que la réinstallation reprendra sous peu avec la reprise économique et je suis convaincu que nous pouvons continuer notre travail pour protéger les réfugiés et les aider à reconstruire leur vie. In Canada, community sponsorship plays a fundamental role in this cause and we are seeing this practice more and more around the world. In fact, Canada's community sponsorship program, in, program started in 1979 as a response to the Vietnamese and Cambodian refugee crisis. At the time, this was a bold and ambitious new idea. And today, some 40 years later, it remains a model followed in countries around the world. Through this form of sponsorship, Canadians have helped to resettle more than 300,000 refugees. And in the process, many lives and in fact, entire communities have been transformed. Last December, when I attended the Global Refugee Forum in Geneva, I had the honor of meeting Dr. Nguyen Tran Davies. Dr. Tran Davies is a physician, an author, and a community advocate and she has told and lived the story of coming to Canada as a young child after escaping Vietnam and being sponsored by a group of Canadians. Years later, Dr. Tran Davies found herself paying that generosity forward by sponsoring several Syrian refugee families to come to Canada. This story is powerful, but it is far from unique, and we've seen it over and over in big cities and small towns right across Canada. And I'll just share with you that I recall talking about Dr. Tran Davies when we were in Geneva and how when she came to Canada, she received a doll from the, uh, a small doll from the family that sponsored her. And when she sponsored the families from Syria, she passed on that doll. And I think in that symbolic gesture, she showed the ongoing commitment of Canadians to continue to sponsor refugees. The Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative was launched so that Canada can share this experience and practice of community sponsorship with others around the world. Many other countries now have their own models. This is encouraging and inspiring and I congratulate you all. Your countries will only stand to benefit. The Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative supports the development of community sponsorship programs by working with governments, community groups, individuals, and businesses alike. We also strengthen and support local host communities that come together to welcome newcomers. These people are the heart and soul of sponsorship. And through their efforts, we promote welcoming and inclusive societies. I've heard many Canadians who've participated in refugee sponsorship say that the experience transformed their own lives in profound ways as much as it transformed the lives of the refugees they helped. Community sponsorship leads to better settlement and integration outcomes for refugees. With a head start and close ties to the communities, families of newcomers are able to adjust and adapt more quickly to life in their new home. They learn the language, find the work, and become thriving members of their communities faster and more successful when they are supported by community sponsors. While refugees are welcomed into the unique countries and communities where these programs are designed, the essence of sponsorship is the same worldwide. They provide a safe home for the refugees who are welcomed and strengthen communities that welcome them. In support of the Global Compact on Refugees, Canada is also con committed to exploring the use of complementary pathways for refugees. In 2018, Canada launched the Economic Mobility Pathways Project to test whether skilled refugees could access our economic programs, and if not, what challenges prevented them from doing so. La première phase a démontré que les réfugiés qualifiés peuvent accéder aux programmes économiques existants avec le soutien de certaines flexibilités administratives. Last month, I announced that Canada will commit to welcoming up to 500 skilled refugees as part of phase two of this program. This demonstrates that outside of our traditional and conventional resettlement streams, 
There are other durable solutions for vulnerable populations as well. And finding new pathways for those displaced is important. Indeed, the need has never been greater. Most importantly, this program recognizes that refugees are not simply vulnerable persons who are a burden or who are in need of help, but rather that refugees have the skills, the drive, the innovation, and the creativity to strengthen and grow the economies and the communities of the countries that welcome them. And it, indeed, it is this principle that has become clearer more than ever during COVID-19. In Canada, refugees have been working on the front lines in hospitals and long-term care homes, in food production, in businesses that have retooled to produce face masks and essential protective equipment, and in many other ways that are helping our country get through this most difficult time. So we must all do our part to ensure that the most vulnerable have a safe, welcoming destination out of harm's way. Equally, we must provide opportunities to skilled refugees whose talents might be overlooked in the commotion of their journey to a new home. Supporting the unique partnerships that enable sponsorship is one way in which we can do this. The settlement of refugees relies heavily on referral partners like the UNHCR and the International Organization for Migration. Partnership with those organizations, along with you, will be essential in the months ahead. Everyone will have the capacity challenges as we resume, and the need will be great. Merci à tous ceux qui se joignent à nous pour la discussion d'aujourd'hui. And thank you to each of you who is contributing to community sponsorship around the world, whether as an individual, a community organization, a business, or a government representative. I look forward to learning about your experiences, challenges, and ideas. And thank you again, Jennifer, for having allowed me to join today. Merci. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, fantastic remarks to get us started. I know you do have a, a cabinet meeting today. We're going to try to bring you back in before you have to jump off the line. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I want to um, jump across the water now and welcome Ilva Johansson, the EU Commissioner for Home Affairs. Commissioner, thank you so much for being with us, and I would love to turn the floor over to you for your remarks. Thank you again. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to the Global Ref Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. I think you're doing a very important job, and I'm so happy to be part of a discussion on how we can welcome more refugees and how that will make us a richer uh, society. Uh, in my experience is that when a community and a person open, when you open your heart and your community to welcome new people, uh, there's a, not only an action of solidarity, it's also a win-win situation that will do something with yourself and with your community and make it richer. That's my uh, personal experience and that's also my experience from the country uh, I, I've come from, uh, from Sweden. So I think this is this is really important. This is an area we need to to step up, and I will tell you more about that. So what we already heard here that it's, it's already it's 80 million um, people that are displaced uh, persons today in the world, and that's one percent of the population of the planet actually, uh, and that means that uh, we have so many people that really are in need of help. Of course, a majority of them to their, their homes uh, in neighboring countries, but not all of them can, can do so. Not all of the displaced peoples are refugees, but all refugees are displaced persons. So I think it's important that we can must step up our uh, efforts to, to help uh, people in, in need. This is also uh, uh, what we also see here in, in the film and also there's a lot of individuals uh, that could find a new future. Uh, there was one uh, a man, a young man from uh, Uganda, Jimmy Servada. Uh, he's, he was uh, he already he always knew that he was gay, and in Uganda, Uganda that was uh, he was being uh, threatened, he was being harassed, he was being arrested, his boyfriend was being killed, and he was became a, a refugee. And thanks to the cooperation with UNHCR, he could find a new future in Sweden. He could find a new life. He could find a new love. He could get married, married in a Swedish church. 
and still and being an, uh, a gay activist. So I think this is uh, shows that this is so important thing that we can do for for individual uh, um, people. Uh, European Union has made huge progress when it comes to resettlement. Uh, since 2015, uh, 70,000 people have found a new welcome in European Union uh, through resettlement. And last uh, this year, we have pledges for 30,000 resettlements in European Union. That's the best uh, ever. And that comes uh, on top of the around 300,000 people that will have uh, a positive asylum decision uh, um, and also being part of our society and being granted protection. So this is this is really important. That makes our uh, European Union are uh, doing 50% of the global total of resettlement. But I would like us to be uh, leading globally. But one reason why we are taking such a huge part is because United States today uh, take a very little part. So I was very happy to hear uh, Joe Biden promising to step up significantly uh, on a resettlement uh, if he was able to uh, to take office. It was really inspiring to listen to to Minister uh, Mendicino from from Canada because Canada is really a leading example here. And in my previous capacity as minister in Sweden, I visited Canada twice just to uh, special special uh, study uh, uh, the community sponsorship and also the integration. And I'm really impressed on uh, what you are doing. And there's a lot uh, to learn uh, uh, from you here. Uh, so I think uh, you are a little bit a role model. But of course, we can't uh, copy that on the European level, but we can be inspired. And I think that um, uh, we already have well, the tradition in Europe is the state-driven um, uh, uh, resettlement, and that will probably continue, and that's important, so we should continue on that. But we have today uh, quite a few projects, but on a small scale, on community or private-sponsored uh, uh, resettlement schemes, and this is something I would like to scale up. Uh, next year, we will, from the European, from the Commission, finance several projects uh, uh, worth four million euros. But I think that we can do even more, and I would like to develop uh, a European approach towards uh, community sponsorship, because I know that there are so many uh, local uh, communities uh, and local. Uh, uh, mayors and uh, uh, private uh, groups that really would like to do more in this area. Uh, so we should uh, also let them do it and welcome them, invite them to do so. Working on a new uh, proposal, a new pact on migration and asylum for European Union. Uh, this is uh, a, a quite uh, challenging task, I must say, uh, because member states and parliament are very divided on this issue. And what we need uh, to do is to uh, move, because Europe uh, need to manage migration better, we need to move from irregular arrivals towards uh, legal pathways and resettlement. Because we, don't, we, we, we do not need fewer migrants, but we need people not risking their lives to come here. And we need them to come in an orderly way and being welcomed in an orderly way when they, when they uh, enter the European Union. And that's why uh, in the uh, new pack that I'm going to put on the table uh, in September on migration and asylum, a new regulation, that will be uh, um, that will be have a specific initiative to scale up resettlement and opening new legal pathways, uh, both for migrants and for refugees, and promoting community and private sponsorship. So that will be an important part of my upcoming proposals and that's why also one reason why it's very good for me to be here with you and to listen to your experience and to your proposals. Thank you. Thank you so much Commissioner. You've given us so much to think about. It's very encouraging and inspiring um, to hear uh, about what is already happening in Europe and also to hear about your plans for the future. Um, we do hope to hear from you again in just a few minutes. Um, I would like to turn first if I may um, to our next speaker, um, we're very, very delighted to welcome Anyam Yunus. Um, she is a member of the first sponsored family to come to Ireland under Ireland's new community sponsorship program. And um, as Ms., uh, Minister Mendicino already gave us an example in Canada, 
she too has already become a sponsor. So it really is amazing how these ripple effects work. And Egnam, I'm delighted to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us to share your story today. Um, hi all, how are you? Apparently you can see I've got support here. I have my friend Kieran Mori, who's also our sponsor. Um, our sponsor. Moving from um, a really stressful situation and circumstances, we were welcomed to Ireland by many friendly faces. We spent our first few weeks meeting new people and receiving welcome letters. That first good impression defined the way that we saw our new country and had a huge impact on every step we took since then. Because community sponsorship is not only about getting a person to a safe zone, uh, it's offering friendship and surrounding the newcomer with positive environment to give them this necessary push towards their new lives. I'm sort of convinced that this positive push got me a job from the very first interview in Ireland. It was great. A few months ago, my husband and I uh, became sponsors in our community group. Uh, before the, just before the pandemic started, so uh, at the same time, we received two family in our village from a reception center. Speaking the so we focused all our efforts on meeting their needs. They had no English, they didn't know anybody. The designated social worker and translator were so far away. So we focused all our efforts on meeting their needs as, as we can. Uh, speaking the same language allowed us to interpret their way to the community. As a group, we managed to provide support teachers for the kids at schools. Uh, two of our people uh, volunteered to give the parents English classes we accompany them to everything they need, uh, appointments, doctors, driving classes, even shopping if they needed to. Um, after two months of, of community support, you can actually see that they reduced talking about going back to their country. They seem uh, really happy talking about learning the language and uh, finding jobs. The ladies seemed so much empowered. I'm not making any confessions here. Uh, I, I really dream about going back to Dublin Airport to receive a new family. This outcome, the outcome of this initiative is so effective and rewarding. It's this new act of, it's a, a genuine act of kindness that can make a true change and I'm forever grateful to be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I am struggling to, to find my voice to come in after such a, a powerful reflections. And I want to acknowledge um, not only uh, you, Engem, for, for sharing your journey with us, but also your sponsors who are there with you um, visibly offering support. It really does embody what these programs are all about. So thank you so much to, to all of you for being with us today and, and for sharing your story. Um, I look forward to hearing about the day you're at the airport welcoming uh, the next family to Ireland. What an incredible journey. Um, I'm going to pop back across to Canada now, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Lori Cooper, one of uh, Canada's most active and I have to say creative sponsors. Um, and in 2016, Lori began partnering with one of Canada's largest hotel chains, the Fairmont Hotel and Resorts, to develop an initiative that allowed her to privately sponsor refugees while also helping to deliver, deliver the labor market needs of a small resort community in um, Western Canada. Laurie, over to you. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to everyone for all of your efforts to spread the good news about uh, private and community sponsorship around the world. Yes, we started this little project in Whistler, which is an international mountain resort here in, on the west coast of Canada. And it has been a huge success. But I wanted to share how simple it really was. Um, I became uh, moved uh, to do something uh, to help refugees after seeing the picture of the little boy on the beach in September of 2015. 
And two months later, I found myself on the beaches of Lesbos, Greece, uh, greeting people who had arrived after a harrowing boat trip from Turkey. I've subsequently made three more trips to work in various refugee camps in Greece, and on each occasion, I met a number of very bright, capable young people who were well-educated and spoke excellent English. I just knew that they would strive uh, wherever they ended up um, if they only had the chance, but I didn't know how to give them that chance. Unexpectedly, the answer came to me in June of 2016 when I had a meeting uh, with the general manager of the Fairmont Hotel in the ski resort of Whistler, Norm Mastelier. I was telling Norm about my volunteer work, and like so many great people I have met around the world, he looked me in the eye and said, how can I help? And I thought, gosh, I don't know, how can the general manager of a luxury hotel help refugees? Then he went on to explain that there was a chronic labor shortage um, in the resort and at the hotel, and he said, if you can bring the people here, we'll give them jobs and housing. And that was it. A plan was born. So since that time, we have sponsored uh, 11 young people who have arrived in Canada, uh, in Whistler, and there are three more in process. Uh, we receive sponsorship spaces uh, and allocation from the British Columbia Muslim Association. They also helped us with sponsorship funds. And then Canada Caring Society, which is the small nonprofit that I started, um, we raised the additional sponsorship funds and we provided the settlement support. So has it been a success? Well, the 11 young people are all thriving. Some of them have been promoted within the hotel. They're moving up the chain. Uh, and others have moved, uh, after working at the hotel, have moved on to other opportunities that were more in line with their background and experience. But each of them, when they arrived, had a full-time job. They had subsidized staff housing uh, in apartments. And after three months, they had full medical and dental benefits. And any of you that have worked with refugees know that they've probably not had dental care for quite a long time. And so this has been a particularly huge benefit. Not only that, they had um, they were immediately welcomed into a very caring and supportive workplace. So has it been a success from the hotel's perspective? Let me just say that uh, there are three more Fairmont hotels who would like to participate. And pre-COVID, there were discussions of up to 200 job offers. Now, the challenge I have is, where do I find 200 sponsorship spaces? If anyone has any ideas, let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to say that, uh, you know, communities and businesses can really quite easily help uh, private sponsorship. So thank you very much for listening. Laurie, thank you so much, and, and thank you, as always, for both doing this hard work and also sharing this story and being such an inspiration for others who are following in your, your footsteps. I know you have inspired a lot of other sponsors beyond um, the, the, those that you've been directly involved in, so thank you very much. I'm conscious of time, and Minister Mendicino, I do know that Cabinet is unlikely to wait for you, um, so I would like to just pause here in the program, if I may, and come back to yourself as well as um, Commissioner Johansson. I think Laurie has pointed us um, to the question of COVID. And if possible, I would love to hear any reflections you have on how COVID may impact your thinking about the future of both refugee resettlement and sponsorship, but also um, narratives about newcomers more generally. If you have any thoughts about what we should be thinking about in terms of threats and opportunities, um, would love to, to hear from you, and Commissioner Johansson, I'll come to you in a moment with the, with the same question, if you have anything um, about COVID that might impact where you're thinking uh, we're heading in this area. Minister, over to you. Thanks again, Jennifer, and to all of the speakers, including um, lastly, uh, Laurie, uh, truly inspirational and hopefully will serve as motivation for all of us to continue uh, moving forward in our uh, joint collaboration. There's no question that COVID-19 has presented significant challenges and disruption to uh, resettling refugees. Um, without, without question, again, I, a big part of that has to do with the travel restrictions that most countries around the world have put into place in response to uh, the contagiousness of this uh, awful virus. And as a direct result, um, the movement of people across international borders has really, really reduced uh, in Canada almost uh, to nil 
when it, uh, it, save and except for uh, essential travel. Now we are starting to see some exceptions, uh, but the uh, rate at which we are introducing new exceptions is very incremental in large part because the situation remains very fluid. In particular on our continent um, in North America, we are very cognizant of the fact that our friends to the south uh, of the border uh, have recently seen a surge in cases. And so uh, mindful of that, uh, we do have to uh, bear, bear in mind that uh, we're not going to simply be able to uh, reopen the borders as quickly as we had to uh, put in place the, uh, the, the travel restrictions. But notwithstanding that, I want to emphasize a couple of things. The first, that we, as I said at the outset, have still found ways to uh, resettle uh, refugees. And certainly uh, those who are in the most dire circumstances, uh, we have been able to work with our partners, especially the UNHCR, uh, to bring them into Canada and to um, really facilitate that, uh, that, that next uh, stage in their life. The second thing is, as I mentioned, is that um, with regards to those who are already here in Canada, uh, my department, and I just want to give them a, a big shout out because it has been an incredibly heavy lift to try and find ways to stand up new processes and innovations to continue to uh, be able to find ways to move along those claimants through the system by accepting uh, claims electronically, uh, by working uh, closely with partners and, um, and in the community as well to be ready to uh, receive when we do resume um, our services is uh, an incredibly important part of the work that we are continuing uh, throughout COVID-19. And then I think uh, lastly, I'll just again highlight that we are still looking at ways to innovate and that includes uh, creating new dedicated streams that leverage uh, refugees with skill sets and with experience that uh, will enable them to accelerate their integration into our economy, into our communities. And, you know, as has been said by a number of the speakers today, it's, it's not transactional. It's it, I mean, true successful community sponsorship starts with compassion. It starts with friendship. It starts with a recognition of the decency and the uniqueness and the special quality in each and every life. And I think that is the, the golden thread that, that pulls together communities that we have seen in Canada. And it is through uh, those experiences and through the work of the GRSI and particularly, you know, Jennifer, your leadership and all of the others who are on this call who are helping to share those, those values and those experiences around the world I think is what is going to be enduring in all of this. And it's certainly not the first time that we've seen a global pandemic, and it uh, sadly probably won't be the last, but if we can preserve these values and preserve that sense of common cause, then I think we'll have created a, a better world for it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. And let me say again what a true pleasure it is to be working in such close partnership with the Government of Canada and the Schuster Foundation, the Open Society Foundations, the UNHCR, all of whom are represented on the call today um, in, to do this work together and also to benefit from your own personal leadership. And we're, we're delighted um, to have you here today and also to continue our work together. So thank you so much. Um, Commissioner, I would love to, to come across um, to you share any reflections you have on, on what you've heard from others so far, um, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm really encouraged of the uh, stories that you bring to me, and I think this also shows the importance that integration is always local. You never integrate to a state. You integrate to a community. Uh, and that's why it's so important to engage with the community already in the beginning. And that's, as I said before, this is really what I would like to um, um, step up on on European level. But just to say a few words also on COVID uh, and how that that's uh, impact. Uh, what what we've seen in Europe is 
two things. One is that the essential workers, those that actually work in the healthcare, the elderly care, and other kind of essential workers, a huge part of them are migrants or with migrant backgrounds. It's been very obvious how important uh, migrants are for European economy, and I think that's very good. We also seen a lot of refugees doing a lot of uh, voluntary work uh, to help with the pandemic. So I think this shows that migrants are not them, they are part of us. So this is important, especially when we can see some um, uh, political leaders uh, arguing for, for the opposite. So this is, this is important to show. But we can also see that resettlement has been partly postponed, uh, put on hold. Uh, so this is what I try to uh, relaunch as, as soon as possible. Uh, we have tried to uh, hold up the, the normal procedures with asylum and, and migration processes, because COVID or not, people have the right to apply for asylum, uh, and you can't take that away just because there's a pandemic. So we try to, to adapt to the situation, and, and we've been, mani we been managing and to do that quite in quite a good way, I should say. But now we are facing a huge uh, risk of a, a huge economic downturn, and that will lead to unemployment, poverty, and that, of course, will hit most the most vulnerable, and that will probably lead to more people not being uh, able to stay and they have to move and be uh, displaced again. So this is really, uh, I think, that one uh, important lesson learned is a, a global uh, pandemic needs a global response. So I think it's important that we show solidarity and that we act together. And that's why when the European Commission now put forward a huge recovery package, it's not only for uh, putting money into the European Union member states. It's also a significant part of that recovery package is uh, designated to third countries to help also other countries and the international community to deal with uh, the challenges that we are facing right now. Thank you. Thank you again, Commissioner. And um, very delighted uh, to benefit from, from all of your remarks. I, I am tempted to continue the conversation. I know that you also have some other engagements this morning. We'll see if we're able to catch you again before you need to jump. Um, but first, I am delighted to turn it over now to my colleague, Gregory Maniatis, a director of the International Migration Initiative at the Open Society Foundation, to introduce our next speaker. Gregory, over to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, I just would like to uh, indulge all of you to make three quick points to start. And that first is many of the remarkable aspects of sponsorship have already been highlighted, but one uh, in particular about the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative hasn't yet. And that is that the diversity of the partners that work with the government of Canada, which has been incredible, the work with UNHCR, with Jennifer in particular, and, and, and uh, the University of Ottawa with Frank and the Gistra Foundation. Bringing all these partners together has been really key to making this uh, movement thrive. And that has never been more clear to me than right now in the middle of a pandemic when there's hundreds of people gathered to be part of this conversation. And that is incredibly moving to me. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is that sponsorship is critical. All kinds of resettlement matter, um, and we really would like to see all the channels thrive. But this kind of resettlement, where you give responsibility to people, to individuals, to average citizens, and they take that responsibility and they run with it, is a generative form of sponsorship. It cascades down through the generations, as we heard from Angam. And that is really special in this moment because it is not transactional, as Minister Mendocino said. This is deep in terms of regenerating a sense of community. And that's why, while it's hard work, once that seed has been planted, it will be like that mighty maple tree in Canada that stands in your front yards for hundreds of years. And the third point I would make is that we are in a moment where we are feeling a little traumatized uh, by the state of the world, uh, by the shutdown of asylum systems, by the suspension of resettlement. And that might, might make us a little hesitant, a little tentative, but we shouldn't be. The 
ability, I think, for the global community, the international community, led by Canada, led by uh, Commissioner Johansson, um, to be able to take on resettlement at scale. This is the moment to do it. As you all have said, we have traveled through this pandemic with a heightened sense of the importance of community and the importance of immigrants. We should not take baby steps on resettlement and sponsorship. This is a chance to really make it much bigger than it is today. So I'll leave it there and I will turn over to one of our DRSI partners, um, Assistant High Commissioner um, Jillian Triggs uh, from the UNHCR. Over to you, Jillian. Thank you all uh, for what has really been a most stimulating discussion. It, it began with a few tears in the eyes watching that video, which is very powerful, but also wonderful to hear the stories of Angam and Lori. Uh, and and uh, very, very encouraging to have such strong support from uh, from uh, Minister Mendiciano and also, of course, from, uh, uh, from Commissioner Johansson. So thank you very much. What I wanted to do then is uh, both to, to congratulate all our wonderful um, states who so generously led the way in establishing these community programs, uh, but also for the opportunity to stress how urgent it has become now to scale up those programs, to increase the number of countries developing community sponsorships, that is to broaden the base to more states and to increase the numbers of places available. Uh, if we could take a very conservative position and just increase by a small percentage, we would actually increase by many thousands the numbers of, pos uh, of possible uh, new places and, uh, and resettlements. Now, in, in, in saying this and urging a scale up of what, we've, what has been done by, by, by so many states so far, we do at UNHCR recognize the very uh, huge strains that COVID-19 has placed on community reception capacities and, of course, on integration itself. But these are exceptional times. And as many of you have mentioned, our Global Trends Report this year uh, has uh, made the point that the numbers of refugees, people displaced in their own country and the stateless, has risen yet again to around 80 million. Now, these figures are almost incomprehensible. And I think perhaps it was Laurie Cooper who mentioned the little boy Alain on the beach the crumpled body of this little boy uh, drowned makes the point perhaps much more powerfully than, than we can at UNHCR with, with these statistics. But it is a, sh a shocking fact that at least 50 percent of those that need resettlement who are refugees are children. Uh, they have been wrenched away from their from their environments and find themselves in, the, in these powerless situations. Our job, as you all know, is to promote international protection for vulnerable people. But sadly, the protection space has been shrinking quite dramatically, just as the needs expand exponentially. Um, 168 states closed their borders, nearly 100 of them denying access to, uh, to asylum. And as Commissioner Johansson has quite correctly said, there is a legal right, one recognized uh, clearly over the last 70 years, to claim asylum. And, and we are urging, of course, that we can both protect public health and ensure, through remote technologies, the ability to give people the opportunity to make that claim. Um, at UNHCR, for the first time in our history, we have actually paused the resettlement program. But I'm really pleased to be able to say here that we are now about to resume that resettlement. Uh, and we'll be doing it um, very encouragingly at the request of many states, including Sweden, and they've asked us to, to get moving again uh, and to get these numbers coming up. But the reality for us is that resettlement places are far too few. And this is in a, a, a context in which, um, although we met our target last year of uh, 64,000 places to 29 countries, that represents just fewer than 5 percent of the 1.4 million uh, people that UNHCR uh, assesses to be in need of urgent resettlement. Um, but the, if there's the context then of so few places, uh, but also it's a context in which the ability to return to the country of origin has now become so extremely difficult. Historically, it might have been easier after a time to return uh, to a country of origin in, in greater peace. But in protracted conflicts that we've seen in Syria, um, we're seeing in parts of, of uh, North Central 
um, America, parts of Africa, it has become extremely difficult to return. And that is why uh, UNHCR is relying so much on community resettlement opportunities, but particularly integration and the development of self-sufficiency. And that's really where these community sponsorship programs come in. They, they provide a durable resettlement opportunity. Uh, they enhance self-sufficiency. Um, but as the point has been made, I think, by many uh, so far this morning, and that is that once citizens become involved, they own the project and become um, become advocates. But also, they they become um, uh, they become personally engaged, and that does have the ripple effect, uh, the the pebble in the pond effect uh, that is so powerful in communities. Um, and I think the point is, of course, that reintegration or integration is local. It, it can't be done at the state level. Um, there have been um, some very encouraging examples, and perhaps curiously, the pandemic has encouraged a level of solidarity among community groups, and we've seen some very encouraging new examples. One of them is the United Kingdom that's now embarked on, um, on something similar to the Canadian model uh, for community resettlement, but has, has, has no ceiling. In other words, if the community embraces uh, new uh, resettlements through the program, uh, then the government will accept those numbers. That is uh, that is really a unique approach, and we're we're really delighted. Other countries like like Norway have a very high level of, of flexibility and pragmatism, and they're taking the places that couldn't be filled this year. Are they now taking them across into next year? Um, where, of course, uh, I think Gregory's made the point about the diversity of partners, and that has been exciting to work with Jennifer in a university, with the foundations, uh, with governments, with the Commission, the European Commission, and others, but also uh, through the refugee, um, the Global Refugee Support Initiative, but also national support groups. And I wanted to mention in particular Spain uh, for um, one of the oldest and, and most successful of our partners. Uh, working through civil society, but engaging about half a million people in Spain, either as donors or as citizens, in in creating this this ripple effect. And we'd love to see more examples of that kind. Um, so I might conclude, if I may, um, by bringing us to back to the values and the language of the Global Compact on Refugees. Um, as you will all know, the the key ideas are global solidarity, but sharing of responsibilities and burdens for those people forced to move. It's, a, it's an inspiring uh, a concept, but of course, one that was agreed before COVID started. And uh, we're now seeing it as imperative to come back to those inspirational values and, of course, to the 1,400 pledges that were made by so many countries. Um, I can speak very personally about the importance of community programs. In my uh, earlier work in Australia, it always was exciting for me to, to go out into country areas. And as you know, country areas, perhaps in a country like Australia, they tend to be conservative, a little cautious, unsure about new people coming in. Uh, but I found time and time again that it was those cautious and careful country communities that would open up their, their arms and generosity in helping to support uh, new families coming through, uh, getting children into school, helping people find work, uh, finding them. Uh, uh, places to live, and I think uh, Ang uh, Angham's example is, is a very good one of that. So thank you all very much, and thank you all for your uh, remarkable support for a program that we would very much like to scale up, and UNHCR stands ready to assist in anything we can that helps to increase these numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Jillian, and thank you for your leadership, for UNHCR's leadership on this, for David Manicombe, Rania, it's been really great to see UNHCR embrace the idea and use its uh, extraordinary organization to help bring it out into the world. I'm going to, um, you've already done a little bit of my prep here by uh, highlighting the work being done in Spain. So I'm just gonna turn it over now to Hannah Jalul, the Secretary of State of, for Migrations in Spain. I can't see you, Hannah, but I presume you're there. Yeah. Um, great. You cannot see me right now? Now we can. Okay, thank you very much. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting dialogue. I've heard many, many interesting things. First of all, you know, the diversity of partners, uh, uh, recognition of diversity, you know, because this is a process where we have to recognize ourselves with all these process, refugees, uh, 
personalities, these stories, this, the, the, the backgrounds of uh, other refugees we are receiving in our countries. I am very glad we receive uh, the comments on uh, Commissioner Johansson on legal pathways and uh, reset and rescaling uh, resettlement. Uh, the stories of uh, Agam uh, and Lori, that wonderful, wonderful. We have to work with realities, and you brought reality to this uh, dialogue, you know, true stories, uh, true successful stories. So we are willing too much to, to do this kind of project. I'm going to explain a little bit of what we're doing here in Spain. And uh, I've heard also words like safe homes. I love that are safe homes for, for these refugees we are talking about in this program. So sponsorship, uh, community sponsorship. So I really love it. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here. Um, it's very nice to hear uh, your experiences. I had to apologize, first of all, sorry, because I will have to leave as early as I finish my, in, in my intervention and really apologize about that because I have an, an, an unavoidable, you know, urgency. Uh, but as I was saying, thanks and to Commissioner Johansson, Mr. of Immigration of Canada, members of Vatican UNCR, all, all the, the participants of this, uh, of this nice uh, dialogue. Um, for us, it's very important to hear our experiences because we have a very successful pilot the project on community sponsorship in Basque Country, and we are working on exporting to the rest of the autonomous communities uh, of Spain. Uh, we we have to adapt the rest of the commu autonomous communities to the pilot project or already have. We are very very uh, happy with the outcome of uh, this project that I will um, I will explain in detail after a few minutes. Uh, for us, we support migration policy. Our migration policies support this kind of project with an inclusive vision. For us, uh, uh, not only refugees, but migrants in general would adapt in our countries with less bureaucratic. We have to work from the bureaucratic point of view, uh, bureaucratic um, processes, as, as we say, so they can integrate quickly. We are particularly, particularly interested in administration, civil society, and companies being involved in the social labor inclusion of all these families that we are trying to resettle here in Spain. And uh, in the case that I'm going to explain after a while in the Basque country, we integrated already five Syrian families. Uh, we brought from Syria last year. And uh, as I just said, the process uh, was uh, wonderful, wonderful. In the midst of inclusion, such as security and migration, and in the Secretary of State uh, of Migration, we intend with our policies to make a positive change by improving the social labor inclusion of migrants and developing actions and regulatory measures that improve their lives and therefore our society in general. We many times talk about refugees coming with us to our country, but this is a bi-directional uh, process, you know. We need to prepare our society and the refugees at the same time, so we can be all at the same level and understanding at the same time the process of integration, inclusion, and how this community sponsorship works. Uh, we support the community sponsorship model because we consider that promoting inclusion even before these people arrive here in Spain is the way to success in their inclusion. So we organize their arrival, knowing the actors who will be part of inclusion. So this is why for us listening your experiences as the case of the Canadian government, we're needing this, this initiative is wonderful. Uh, as we have mentioned, as it has been mentioned all the time, we need to work with this kind of projects at local level. Because, you know, here in Spain, we have the host system in general, that is the responsibility of the state. And then we will develop, we are developing this kind of community sponsorship projects at the local level. We don't integrate and do inclusive policies of this, uh, uh, of these families that we're bringing from the outside in their local, you know, circumstance, atmosphere, you know, it's not it's not gonna work really people need to live work and be part of the place where, where they are having their social network so uh, it's important to highlight also that this has to go hand by hand fighting racism and xenophobic discourses here in spain from the secretary of state for immigration we have an observatory as a kind of research center at called over which uh, already published uh, did a very in interesting research in 2018 and it's an exhaustive study uh, deployed in a Madrid, Madrid neighborhood uh, that has um, one of our uh, refugee center for attention of refugees. The objective was to measure potential change in trends and attitudes 
identifying and measuring racist discourses were in, in, in a neighborhood particularly affected by economic crisis and especially familiar with migration. The outcome of that study was very interesting, were very interesting for us. Um, so th that help us to understand how important is the community sponsorship project, especially at local level, and how we can address it. Sometimes, in, in one, depending on the neighborhood, more or less conflict or, or uh, you know, um, uh, their, their opinions or their discourses or their feeling they have towards, you know, refugees or migrants in, in, in general. Uh, what we, um, we've seen also is that indigenous population does not distinguish between immigrants, refugees, uh, or asylum seekers. So this aspect is important for any public policy, given the confusion that reigns and sometimes, you know, encourage some or certain uh, discourses. Uh, the process of selecting the families that will host these fami uh, um, refugee families, as well as actors involved, who will accompany these families for their integration, contributes to de dilute that uh, confusion. So it's important in order to eliminate the stereotypes, you know, that uh, the isolation of people uh, or refugees in this specific context, the lack of public spheres of discussion, breakdown of social network is therefore uh, the greatest danger. Uh, so community sponsorship goes precisely in the direction of alleviating this problem, accompanying to avoid isolation, creating close network from the local sphere, you know, uh, that will protect the community for the materialization of racism and uh, as you, you just put examples today, you know how successful is uh, the particular projects that uh, Agan mentioned before the lorry. So we are willing to export this project to the rest of the, the community, the rest of the autonomous communities in Spain, because we are uh, we already have one in the in the Basque Country, as I just said. In June 2019, and the Secretary of State for uh, Migration signed an agreement with the Basque Country, UNCR, Caritas Basque Country, Jesuits of Basque Country for the development for, of this uh, pilot project and community sponsorship for the reception and integration of resettled persons. I have to say that we came here with this new administration in the government in February, and uh, 15 days after, I was um, Called the Secretary of State for Migration, we brought uh, 55 uh, refugees from uh, from Syria, and now um, then suddenly COVID came to our lives, this horrible pandemic, and now we are willing to bring another 200 people in in this in between these next uh, two months. So we will try to uh, to organize these people in some um, autonomous communities within this uh, community sponsorship uh, programs. Um, the, the families that we have proposed at that time last year to Basque Country uh, by our ministry and among the refugees proposed uh, by the UNHCR uh, were interviewed by this ministry also and took place in October uh, 2018, so we moved uh, very quickly. Uh, I have to say that refugees participating in this pilot project receive benefits comparable to those provided under our state reception system. And uh, it's uh, very important to put in place that this project for refugees uh, are 100% uh, supported by, by the government of uh, Spain. As I just said, we are going to reset another 200 uh, people in these next two months. And uh, we will try to do this with a program of community sponsorship, of course. It's important to say that um, the, the families sometimes that uh, we were working with for this uh, pilot project, they came, went to the airport to receive some families. I just, uh, Agam said, you know, um, both entities holding the sponsorship agreement and members of local uh, sponsorship groups met before arrival with the representatives of our ministry, which manages the national refugee reception system in order to understand previous processes that have been carried out with the families to resolve any, uh, any doubt. They received also a specific training during a week before their arrival from experts in sponsorship from Canada. So thanks again, because you are leading us, you know, you're the leading role model here, pioneer country in the development of this um, initiative. So uh, uh, some uh, conclusion remarks. Families are making tremendous progress in learning the language. The local sponsorship groups is their family and uh, they are fundamental support for the processes of integration and inclusion in the, com in, in the community. We are stressing too much toward inclusion because integration not always means inclusion, but inclusion always means integration. 
uh, local sponsorship groups also demonstrate the learning about what it's really like to be a refugee. You, we need to put ourselves in the place of others. Uh, very positive synergies have been created between the five local sponsorship groups, uh, sharing the experiences and learning from each other. They have created emotional bonds with the volunteers in the local group and are making great strides in their literacy, Spanish learning and integration in their communities. Uh, for example, they, ha they like to see how volunteers organize themselves in the afternoon to take care of the younger children, um, to assist and in order to uh, help them to assist in the Spanish courses uh, offered by the cities. Um, I mean, we we are doing this. These programs are so humanitarian, so they are so in touch with the real world, to the real life of these people. And I think that is a very, very, very positive initiative. Uh, definitely, the, the government of Spain is going to invest a lot in this kind of projects. And um, well, uh, I would I, I'm going to finish here because otherwise I, that will take too long. Thanks for uh, for listening and thanks promoting this kind of uh, virtual dialogue, which I think are super important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for um, such an inspiring rendition of what's happening in Spain for your vision, but also for the scale of your ambition, which is great to hear. And I just want to second your call for inclusion um, as, um, as the right way to think about this. So I'm going to turn now to one of the um, earliest um, supporters of the idea of uh, community sponsorship and somebody who has been instrumental in helping us um, advance the idea. Uh, he was Father Michael Cherney um, when we met him. He's now Cardinal Michael Cherney. He has been uh, a leader not only on this, but on all issues related to migrants and refugees at the Vatican. And we're delighted to have you here, uh, Cardinal Michael. Thank you very much. It's uh, really a pleasure, a pleasure to listen and to, uh, uh, I don't know if we all realize how lucky we are to be uh, in, a, in an encounter, in a dialogue about uh, migrants and refugees and not be uh, talking uh, statistics and uh, crisis and uh, all sorts of uh, not only concepts but images which uh, paralyze us because it seems so impossible and so even so frightening. So even to be able to talk about this uh, positively together is itself a miracle and uh, that's uh, I think a good sign of the health of this uh, program and proposal. And it's true that COVID has caused enormous suffering and uh, upset and damage and we have yet to I learn really what it's going to mean to live with COVID from now on. But in a strange way, as we were locked down and locked in, uh, somehow uh, I have a feeling that many of us were also brought out of ourselves. Uh, I think uh, people discovered uh, some things about what makes life worthwhile. And many of those things, um, in fact, are what we have mentioned in the course of this dialogue. Uh, and. Uh, I don't think the word profit or consumption or uh, international tourism came up at all, things that used to maybe occupy many of our minds, but instead uh, compassion and welcome and uh, sharing of life. So I know it's idealistic, but I'm hoping that COVID will shock us into becoming uh, more welcoming and uh, more uh, human and therefore, uh, as Pope Francis invites us also to take better care not only of our brothers and sisters, but also of our common home, because all of that uh, goes together. Uh, I wasn't planning on this, but since others have spoken about early experiences, I realized that more than 30 years before uh, Canada invented the uh, sponsorship program, um, my brother, younger brother and parents were stuck in Europe. We couldn't go back uh, to Czechoslovakia and we had no place to go. And a high school chum of theirs, of my parents, who had just arrived in Canada two years earlier with his wife and young son, uh, had the courage to guarantee us, which is an old uh, word for sponsorship or uh, an old word for a part of sponsorship. They had to take responsibility for us in case we didn't work out so that we wouldn't be a burden on the state. And it was with their signature and their support that we were able to come to Canada in 1949. 
So I feel like I'm a, a well over 70 year old uh, product also of the uh, sponsorship program in a uh, other form and therefore would like to testify that it's a very good idea indeed uh, because I don't know uh, where uh, or if I would be speaking with you tonight uh, if it weren't for that. Uh, Pope Francis has, often speaks of the Good Samaritan. Uh, this is, uh, you can think of him as a kind of a traveling salesman who uh, showed himself to be a true neighbor. Uh, we could now say a true sponsor. Uh, be, why? Because he offered concrete hope. And this is one of the things that Pope Francis, I think, has made uh, clear, not only with his words, but also with his gestures, that uh, when you want to give someone hope, uh, uh, words won't do, uh, cheerful slogans won't do, um, optimism won't do. Instead, uh, what you need to show is a fighting spirit uh, willing to take up uh, that person or that uh, family's or that community's needs and to hang in with them towards the goal. And uh, I think that's another way of understanding sponsorship. It's not a cheering society. Uh, it's a um, hanging in society. It's, uh, and it, uh, it grows because it is doing something uh, so well. And uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, when he was uh, especially moved to uh, uh, promote uh, the cause of refugees, uh, Pope Francis ap appealed in a very concrete way to all the parishes, religious communities, monasteries and shrines of Europe, and he said to, I want each of you to host one family. And he said, I'll begin with my own diocese of Rome. And indeed, Rome, the Diocese of Rome, with, of which he is the bishop, uh, sponsored some refugee families from Syria, uh, whom he met uh, uh, on Lesbos. The beautiful part of the story is that two years later, he himself was visiting the University of Rome for an encounter with students. And one of the uh, spokespeople of the group, one of the students who was chosen to speak, uh, began to speak, and as he was listening, he said, "This sound is this person seems a bit familiar to me. I can I have met her before?" And it turns out that she was indeed one of the people that he sponsored uh, himself, and who she was now finishing her degree at the University of Rome and was preparing for a, a career, I think, in uh, one of the sciences. So it's not just uh, ideas or theories, it's, uh, it's praxis. And I, uh, I, I doubt that we have reached the quota of one family uh, per parish, community, monastery, or shrine. But I hope that with the encouraging, some of the encouraging things that were said by the European uh, speakers so far, that it'll be possible to, uh, to sponsor more families uh, here in Europe. Uh, I can't add very much to the wonderful things that have been said um, because uh, they, are, they are the right things to do and experience is proving uh, that they are the right things to do. So let me leave you with uh, two uh, kind of questions that I have in my mind. One of them uh, comes from an experience uh, I had on the Guatemala-Mexico border uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, speaking with the uh, parish community there that was itself doing so much difficult work in uh, helping the very vulnerable people on that border, which not, include, not only is questions of uh, dealing with their poverty and their needs, uh, but also with uh, some very aggressive attitudes from uh, authorities and also uh, gangs and uh, um, organized crime. So the, the, the dangers cannot be uh, exaggerated. And uh, in the course of that visit, um, I had the chance to meet a, someone from a family who described what they did for uh, some refugees who had come across from Guatemala into Mexico. And being a Canadian, when they finished the, their uh, second or third paragraph of description, I thought to myself, well, well they're they, they're sponsoring. What are they doing? They're sponsoring. 
So these are these these utterly poor local people who are sponsoring refugees who are coming over. And so I ask myself, and if I may, I even challenge us, uh, all of us around this wonderful huge table. Uh, could we not help poor people to sponsor rather than only think that sponsorship can be to bring them from uh, lands of extreme poverty to the relative prosperity of our countries? Or could we not, could we not help them to sponsor? Uh, and uh, I think as soon as I mention it, you can uh, immediately begin to think of the potential of a program that would allow, that would help uh, people in border areas, or not even border areas, but in countries that we usually think of as refugee producing or, my, or displaced producing countries, to turn around and do for their own poor people what we are so happy to do for the ones who come to us. I think it's, uh, it's not only a good idea, there's a kind of a justice to it too, that, uh, that if, we, if, if we have this good idea underway among us, then we should also make it possible for others uh, to do the same. And the second and perhaps more difficult thing is whether we shouldn't also take a second look at other uh, vulnerable people among us who need something like sponsorship. And uh, uh, if I could take one uh, uh, category that has been made more visible, thank God, by the COVID uh, crisis, it's uh, vulnerable seasonal farm workers. These are, these are uh, poor, displaced people among us, and I suppose the word us covers most of the countries that are around this table. And uh, nobody is thinking about sponsoring them, but maybe we should. Maybe, maybe we need to see how uh, some of the same very good ideas that we've been having for people from far away, and that has its own attraction and, and so on, uh, whether uh, some of that couldn't apply to people among us who uh, need to be, as Pope Francis would say, they need to be welcomed, they need to be protected, they need to be promoted, and they need to be integrated. This is his fourfold formula for what our whole enterprise is all about. And uh, I think maybe we could find ways of doing that for the people who, at least here in Italy, they're beginning to point out, you know, if we weren't here, you don't eat. But uh, they, that doesn't translate into, um, into uh, dignity, uh, rights, and services that they deserve. So uh, with this combination of stories and thoughts, I thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, if I may, I am very happy to wish you uh, all the best, also in the name of Pope Francis. And I look forward to hearing about many, 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 many more very positive stories of sponsorship from all around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cardinal uh, Attorney. And so wonderful to hear you talk about how this moment can rekindle our humanity, overcome our individualism. And um, I love the idea of making sure that everyone can sponsor, not just those who are relatively comfortable. Um, that is also a critical part of, I think, this mission. I'm going to turn it now over to the Director for Europe of the um, Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative at the Refugee Hub at the University of Ottawa, Julia de Blasing. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gregory. I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, I'll take over this last part of the, of the um, uh, moderation and I'll do it very quickly to turn us over back uh, into Europe to a program that several have already mentioned as a important leadership and inspiration for many. Uh, the colleagues uh, from the UK have launched a very important uh, initiative already now for some years that is becoming one of the reference points when it comes to sponsorship. So without any further ado, uh, I will pass on the floor uh, to Madame Terni from the Home Office uh, and then we will have the opportunity to see a video that has been recorded by uh, Minister Philip uh, on the sponsorship program. Thanks so much, Julio, and um, hello, everybody. Um, I've sat here absolutely um, in awe for the last um, hour and a half, listening to all these um, incredibly powerful and moving stories. And when I saw the video for the first time yesterday as well, I, I was similar to Jennifer, I got goosebumps, really. Um, so look, I'm delighted to be here with you all and part of this important discussion. I'm actually relatively 
Can you hear me? Sorry. I'm relatively new to the Home Office. Um, I've only been in this role for four months, but I understand from my team, particularly um, Nicola and Hannah and Gemma, that they've known many of you for many years and that they see you as colleagues and friends, particularly Jennifer and Gregory, and that I now feel very fortunate to be part of this um, international team. So thank you. And I really look forward to working with you all. I think um, it's been one of the areas in my new role that I've become incredibly um, interested in in the last four months. We've heard people today talk about the challenges of COVID and what that means as well. But we do have a very established community sponsorship scheme. You saw some of our success stories in that video. Um, but I think today it's given us all a chance to take stock about what the future holds and how we can continue to build and strengthen how we do this. Um, we're rightly very proud of our scheme in the UK. And um, you know, we have, um, it's a growing scheme. It's fantastic. We already have 450 refugees and are being supported by 80 sponsorship groups across the UK. And the stories we hear from these groups and the stories from the refugees themselves are um, incredibly inspirational. Keenly aware of the impact of COVID and what, that's, and what that's meant for our resettlement operations and how we've had to um, pause them temporarily. But we are looking forward, um, as was mentioned, I think Gillian mentioned it, to you know, when, when we can reopen those routes. I don't think any of us can predict the longer term impact of the pandemic. So it's right that we take now the time to think about um, the new approaches and just building on what the Cardinal was saying, thinking about those four tenants and how we can take those forwards. I'm really sorry the Minister um, is unable to join us today, Minister Philp. He does send his apologies. He'd have really liked to be here. And I'm going to show you a video that he's recorded. And before I'd like to do that, I'd just like to set out my thanks for the support, particularly of Canada and GRSI, continue to show to the UK and to my team. We're very, very appreciative of that. Next week marks four years since our scheme began. We've learned lots along our way and we're very happy to share our experiences and what we're planning to do next. We know that we need to continue to grow and we really appreciate these opportunities to learn from experts and hear what you've done. And I'm going to borrow unashamedly from that very powerful video and finish by saying compassion exists in big and small communities all around the world. And I've seen that in its strength today. So let's get on and mobilise it. Thank you. I'll hand over to the video from Minister Philp, if that's possible. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Julia. I was delighted to hear that today's panel was being convened and I'm only sorry that I cannot be with you in person to participate. I am, however, so pleased that we in the United Kingdom are working closely with a growing number of countries to expand the use of community sponsorship schemes around the world. Responding to refugee displacement is a shared challenge for the international community. The UK is clear in its ongoing commitment to supporting refugees, whether that is through refugee resettlement, humanitarian assistance or other means. Community sponsorship plays a key role in the global response. It saves lives and offers stability and safety to those refugees most in need of protection. Like many other countries represented today, the UK has stepped up its commitment to refugee resettlement in recent years, pledging to take in some 20,000 refugees fleeing the conflict in Syria. I am pleased to say that we are now close to meeting that commitment. But we know that governments cannot and do not do it alone. Across the world, local communities have played a vital role in helping those who have been resettled build a new life. In the UK, with the voluntary support of more than 300 local authorities, tens of thousands of refugees fleeing often brutal violence and insecurity have now found safety. Community sponsorship embodies that collective effort, enabling our citizens to directly welcome and support refugees, an approach that has brought communities together and help refugees to establish the support networks they need to recover and thrive in our country. Community sponsorship is very much a community-led scheme with groups of people across the country coming together to provide refuge to vulnerable families. Each one of these groups, each one of these volunteers is playing their part in responding to the global refugee crisis. Last year, the government was pleased to announce that once we meet our commitment to resettling 20,000 refugees fleeing the Syrian conflict, we would continue to resettle refugees under a new global UK resettlement scheme. We will do this as soon as coronavirus circumstances allow. We were on the cusp of moving into this next phase of resettlement when coronavirus was declared a global pandemic. The pandemic has touched so many aspects of our lives. 
while it while it is remarkable how so many of us have been able to adapt we do not underestimate the challenges that covid 19 presents to the resettlement schemes to community groups preparing to resettle a family and most importantly to those waiting to be resettled i'm greatly encouraged however that sponsorship remains a priority for our communities in the uk we have continued to see community groups submitting applications throughout the pandemic We've also not stopped the important work of finding ways to make the UK programme better, for example, by improving integration and employment outcomes. From the outset, we have worked alongside our key partners in local government and civil society to find ways to make it easier for more community groups to become sponsors. That work continues. The UK is proud to play a leading role in the international community, including supporting other countries to implement their own community sponsorship schemes. We all share a common goal, goal to provide sanctuary, a warm welcome and integration support to refugees in need of protection. There is much we can learn from one another. We are hugely appreciative of the support we have received from Canada and the GRSI. It has made a big impact on supporting the growth of the UK scheme and on schemes worldwide. In the UK, we recognise the positive difference community sponsorship has brought to the lives of refugees resettled in the UK and to the inspiring communities that support them. It is only made possible by the dedication, hard work and compassion of community groups. We know that community sponsorship transforms lives. The families resettled with sponsors are thriving in the UK and we consistently hear how sponsorship has changed communities for the better, bringing people closer together. Community sponsorship is special. With that, I wish you the best for your meetings today. I look forward to hearing about the valuable conversations that will certainly take place. Thank you. Good place. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, UK. Um, I'm back again just to briefly introduce um, Frank Gister in just a, a second, uh, and also just to flag that we are um, going to be running a little bit long. I hope the um, quality of all of these incredible interventions uh, merits your time. And um, now I'm just going to turn it over to Frank with a, just a brief preface to say when we conjured with the Government of Canada and Jennifer um, and the UNHCR, the idea of uh, GRSI in September of 2016, Frank was the very first person to say, I'm in, to support it. Um, literally within minutes of uh, my calling him up, and he has been a steadfast supporter of the GRSI ever since then, and also an extraordinary voice and philanthropist in the space of refugees. So I'm um, really, always honored to work with you, Frank, and, and hand it over to you. Hi, Gregory. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, good. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction. They're very kind of you. Um, I thought I would just uh, give a diff slightly different perspective uh, and a little bit of background, which I think is relevant to why this initiative is uh, so important. Um, like Lori Cooper, I found myself on the uh, beaches of Lesbos in 2015 at the height of the uh, Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, we were there to do a lot of humanitarian work, which was very uh, was needed, uh, <laughs> urgent humanitarian work, uh, which was needed at, at the time. While we were there and over the course of three years, we filmed a documentary. Uh, some of you might have seen it, it was called Inside My Heart, which chronicled the lives three refugee families as they were trying to make their way through Europe once they landed on, on Lesbos. And um, I think that it, the story really brought home the sort of things that I saw while I was there and on the many other trips that I made uh, during the last sort of five years. And that was really giving the perspective at a human level. And as Jillian said, um, you know, half of these refugees are children. And Throughout the whole piece, I, I, all, with all my visits, I was always thinking of my own children. I was thinking, what if we had everything taken away from us, our future, our hopes, education, and, uh, and listening to the stories of the challenges and hardships that these families had to cope with uh, during the course of trying to resettle themselves. It, was, it, it made this, when, when Gregory called me, and as he said, I think he was halfway through his pitch when I said, yes, count me in, um, because I recognized right away the importance of what we were trying to do. Um, it, it was uh, Canada had a great model. 
uh, it was obvious to me that many other countries throughout the world would see this as a very useful model to incorporate um, to resettle refugees. Uh, it just made a lot of sense. You know, this refugee problem is not going away anytime soon. I was just in Venezuela recently doing some humanitarian work, sorry, in Colombia doing some humanitarian work with Venezuelan refugees. And it just reminded me of the hardships that these people have faced. You know, they're just leaving their homes with nothing and they're trying to resettle into other countries where they have no, no opportunity. And I think, you know, the, the idea of community sponsorship where the refugees are brought in really does solve a lot of the problems of, ref, you know, refugees when they're moving across borders. Um, you know, I, I think obviously the, the, the obvious solution to, to refugee to the refugee crisis, it's to avoid deadly conflicts, and uh, and that's why I'm the co-chair of the International Crisis Group, which is in in the business of trying to prevent an ad de deadly conflict. But we're always going to have these these situations. Uh, so in the meantime, I think it's important that the private sector comes in and supports this this initiative, and um, uh, businesses, individuals, philanthropists like myself. Um, I, I think your, your support is greatly needed. So if, you, if you're out there listening, you know, learn about what we're doing. Come in, support us. It, it's really important work. I want to thank you, Gregory, for, for, for your dedication to this. I want to thank Jen, obviously, who's done a lot of the work at the University of Ottawa. I want to thank the UNHCR and um, Open Society in, uh, in, uh, Foundation in general, and obviously uh, the Canadian government, the two ministers who were on earlier. Um, and my uh, right-hand person, Laura Daphne, who's represented me in a lot of these uh, GRSI uh, board meetings. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, hopefully you will you will you will join us if you're out there listening. Thanks, Gregory. Thank you, Frank. Jennifer and Julie, over to you. Thank you so much, Frank, and thank you um, as always for your your partnership and also for your comments for being with us very early in Vancouver time when Frank joined this call today. So so thank you very much, Frank, and and as as I said earlier, it's such a privilege to be part of this very dynamic multi sectoral partnership and to have a chance to gather here today um, with representatives really from all different parts of sponsorship, private sector, governments, community members, the UNHCR, colleagues from all over the world, um, really collecting to, to celebrate and think about the future of this um, very powerful model. And Frank, you've been, you've been a partner in exploring that future um, for as long as we've been doing the work. So, so thank you so much and for joining us so early this morning. I'm going to transition now to Mariana Marquez, who is joining us from Argentina. Um, she is speaking on behalf of Amnesty, another very critical partner in um, pur pursuing sponsorship. We do anticipate closing in approximately five minutes. We are aware we're a little bit over time. Thank you so much for staying with us. Um, Mariana, important we hear what's happening in Argentina. Delighted to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, it's a really an inspiring uh, opportunity to be listening to all of you and to be part of this conversation. I'm going to tap a little bit into what Amnesty has been doing uh, in community sponsorship globally and in Argentina very quickly. Uh, so Amnesty has been working on community sponsorship for almost four years now. We are currently working on eight countries from all different regions. And during these years, together with this great community of champions, uh, we have participated in the creation of new sponsorship pilots. We have seen these pilots and other existing programs evolving and growing. And most importantly, we have seen hundreds of newcomers being welcomed by communities across the globe in true inspiring stories like Engans and Laurie's here today that keep us all so motivated. Now, together with my colleagues, we have decided to take this challenging time as an opportunity to come together and work on a revised strategy across our different teams and country experts that we hope will respond to immediate needs of refugees and sponsors, support building and maintaining inclusive communities, map emerging trends, challenges, and opportunities, and for us, which is very important, continue to ensure national lessons are contributing towards sponsorships, regional and global improvement and development. 
it's really inspiring to know that we are not alone in this process. And this conversation and all of you here today is a sort of living proof of that. In fact, I can see here some of the community leaders and champions from Argentina, with which I have the pleasure to work with. Argentina has resettled over 400 Syrian refugees through a community sponsorship program that, just like the UK's, has no ceiling. To advocate and support the growth of community sponsorship in the country, civil society organizations, communities, and international agencies have come together and created an Argentine community sponsorship network. In fact, we just met yesterday, and even during this uncertain and challenging time, our friends and colleagues here gathered to talk, among other issues, about the first national sponsors meeting that took place a couple of weeks ago by Zoom. And we also talked about how to resume conversations with local authorities after a recent change in our administrations. And most importantly, we talked about how to collaborate in order to support the eight sponsoring groups that are currently waiting for newcomers to arrive as soon as our borders open again. And also how to recruit new sponsor groups since there are around 120 Syrians refugees enabled by UNHCR and approved by our government to travel to Argentina as soon as the border lifts again and restart their lives. Well, our activities in Argentina, at Amnesty, and here with all of you have the same goal, uh, keep this community alive so that we can transform our own communities, joining forces, sharing knowledge, keeping the momentum, help each other, staying bold and ambitious, keep the pipeline open today so that we can scale up community sponsorship, resettlement, opportunities for refugees tomorrow. Thank you so much. Mariana, thank you so much. And I think those are very inspiring words on which to close. Amnesty has been a part of growing community sponsorship programs all around the world. And I think it really does speak to the, the team effort and the great joy of this work that we were able to open um, hearing from ministers and commissioners um, talking about their big vision from this work and now close um, with the view from uh, Amnesty International really on the ground in, in dozens of countries helping to drive this effort forward. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us today. Um, certainly thanks to all the speakers. Um, thanks also to all of the audience members. As I mentioned, we had people participating from over 30 countries, and I really think it does um, speak to the community around community sponsorship that we were able to gather in this way. So thank you again for joining us. Um, Cardinal Alterney, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom. Frank, so much for your ongoing partnership. Um, Amnesty uh, colleagues who are joining us across um, across the world, delighted to have you here. Thank you so much to the sponsors and to uh, newcomers who have become sponsors for joining us. And of course, thanks to my partners at the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. It is a joy to do this work together every day. We'll close on this point and we look forward to continuing together along this path. Enjoy your, your afternoon, your evening. Take good care. <laughs>